Hello everyone, Colin Turner here. Um, in case you don't know who I am, uh, I am the creator of the Free World Charter. Um, I am somebody who's been like a money-free advocate for uh, many years, uh, maybe eight or nine or ten years or thereabouts. And um, uh, Eric Schmidt very kindly asked me to uh, do an interview a few months ago um about sort of my own work and that sort of stuff so this is kind of a um, just a follow-up video to see um if anyone has any questions or any uh anything they'd like to any comments they'd like to make um about me or about my work or about the money free world or the money free ideas in general I'm more than happy to uh, try and uh, answer anything as best i can so give me your best shot so in the meantime, while I'm waiting for a few people to join, I'll just um, fill you in more or less on who I am and what I've been doing for the last uh, few years. So in 2011, I started this thing called the Free World Charter, which is like um, it's like uh, an online document of ten fundamental principles for creating a an optimal society, um, money free. It being really just one aspect of that um, the main parts of that um, document are really all about um, realizing our true place within the, the current ecosystem and um, our responsibilities and relationships towards each other and how that um, it's just going to be better for us long term to be able to to be uh, looking after each other's needs um, because in the long term this uh, cooperation always beats competition so um, obviously as part of that then, the, the, the idea of um, money-free society sprang from that where um, it's, you know, because we have a, like a competitive market system, as we all know, um, that this is obviously something that is like what we call a zero-sum game that eventually the, you're, you're creating a system where there must ultimately be one winner. And as we can see, of course, with the um, these the, the wealth divide in the world that, of course, we don't have one winner, but we have as a very small group of people with concentrated wealth. And um, we obviously, most people don't really think too much about that, but there are many people like me and others who do think a lot about that and think that that's absolutely unacceptable. Um, of course, everyone born into the world deserves to have a really good shot at life, um, whatever that is. And of course, most of us and many of us don't get the best um, shot at life for reasons that are completely outside our control. And mostly um, the location we're born in really dictates an awful lot about how um, our life is going to play out. So that's uh, something that uh, obviously is unfair. You know, if you're born in somewhere back village in Africa or India or China or something like that, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have a much, much harder climb to try and get up to the, the top of the heap or to even, even to where somewhere, someone like I am, you know, it's, I'm very aware of that, that we do, um, we have a pyramid structure. This is how our society is organized. And of course we have the top few who are with concentrated wealth. And of course, people like me and people like maybe a lot of people watching here who are not at the top of the pyramid, but they're not at the bottom of the pyramid either. We're kind of somewhere floating around the middle and we're kind of, uh, we're, we're forming part of that structure as well. And I think it's important that everyone takes cognizance of that because it's, uh, it's important to see that we are not, uh, that we're all basically instrumental in uh, maintaining that structure. So it's not just the so-called elite, 1% and uh, blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, I'll just see a couple of comments coming through. I'll, I'll just continue going a little bit more. I'll come back to comments. Um, yes, yeah, so the Free World Charter then is something that um, it, it kind of it came in on this sort of the tide of the Zeitgeist movies and uh, when Facebook was really in the ascendancy. And it's um, it really took off. There's a lot of people who support that initiative, and I'm very happy about that. And, of course, my own um, thinking and ideas evolved over those seven or eight, nine years. Uh, where basically I, I consider, spent a lot of time thinking about how this really was going to play out in the practical sense, in real life, real terms. It's very easy to write, write nice things, but, um, and it's very, neat, very easy to have kind of uh, idealistic pl plans and visions, but actually uh, putting them into 
into work in the real world is really a, another matter entirely. And I, I cannot stress strongly enough how important that really is because at the end of the day, you can, you can, write, you can write anything. You can make up any idea and write it on a piece of paper and say, look, this is, this is great. But at the end of the day, if you, if you can't put that into action and into real practice, and it's worthless. You know, it really is worthless. And there's so many people out there who just write reams and reams and reams and reams of stuff about that. And it's not maybe maybe worthless is a bit strong, but it's like its value is like it's really, really quite small. It's good for inspiring um, people to act, but to actually to create the sort of changes that we like to that we want to see is uh, really, really a, a tough task. So I, I sort of took that on in uh, many ways, and I um, I. I well, I wrote um, a fictional novel, which kind of uh, wrote, um, sort of proposed a sort of a, a transitional account for going from this type of world to that sort of world, because I thought that was a useful exercise to actually say, well, well, how would it play out? You know, in in a, in a real practical sense. And uh, I'm happy to say that lots of people have read that and enjoyed that book. And uh, for me, it was actually quite um, an enlightening experience in a lot of ways because. Um, having to forcing myself to write my way through that situation in a, in a, in a plausible way was a, a good way of actually thinking well how actually is this stuff really going to work in real life so that was um, that was the book F day which um, which you can get on Amazon and uh, but because there were so many like good ideas that came from the F day book so I thought then I actually produced another little small book called into the open economy which was kind of designed to be kind of like a companion book for that so it's kind of a it's a non-fiction and basically uh, details really what I think what are the summary of the problems and what are the um, what are the summary of the solutions and the, the practical ways of the, the practical things that we can do now today and uh, that's like some years ago now and uh, we've been working on other things we worked on the free world or website which is like a, a free sharing network uh, we have like a couple of thousand people on that now who are basically sharing goods and services freely among each other. Uh, that to me is like, uh, this is the prototype community, you know, it's it's online. I think that's the most easy way to make a prototype community is is online where you uh, basically, you have, because, because it's so difficult to create people with this kind of mindset in a very small concentrated location, we have to go online because we're all scattered all over the world. And I'm happy to say that lots of people have joined in that that um, that initiative and uh, are happily sharing goods and services online. Small amount, but it's getting there. You know, it's getting there. And um, we have big plans for that um, in the next uh, year, a couple of years. We're going to make a, an app and uh, do a bit of a lot of work on that to improve it as well. So, um, so I'm really looking forward to um, to chatting with you guys. Um, if you want to find out any way, a bit more about me, you can, I think just Google Colin Turner, Colin R. Turner, you'll probably find uh, some information about me there. I have a blog page which has a kind of bio and stuff. And um, yeah, so you'll find a few other bits and pieces out there. Okay, so now we have a comment from Lloyd Allen McPherson, who, a guy who I know very, very well, actually, and uh, we, have a, we have great chats. So he was saying, best shot, now that children are ingesting in the tens of thousands of micro pieces of plastic and that recycling has been ex exposed as a farce it is. Can we say that business won out over humanity finally and then start clean up government subsidized? Well, yeah, actually, this is this is kind of touching on uh, myself and Lloyd agree on, on quite a few things, actually. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to see he's writing there because um, one of the things that I think he and I agree on um, is the that we shouldn't be throwing away the the baby with the bathwater? A lot of people who are kind of uh, who follow these kind of money free ideas are really anti government, anti establishment. They want to you know whatever hang the bankers or sack all the politicians, put all this sort of stuff away. I think that's I think it's kind of careless and irresponsible. I think it's it's naive to suggest that that everything is bad about the system because it just isn't. It just isn't. If you I don't know, if you suddenly just vacuumed out, out that system overnight, there would, there would be a chaos. There really would be chaos because we do have these administrative, administrative structures in our societies, certainly in the developed world, very much so, very, very um, advanced uh, administrative structures 
which really do help um, a, lot, a lot of people in a lot of ways. So I know it's not ideal, I know it's not the best thing that we want for, but we have to say, well, look, it's not all bad, it's not all bad. And so there are things that can happen and are happening at government level. And that's something that's, I think, really important for people to realize is that um, there is a big push towards eco eco solutions at government level they're providing grants they're building out they're, they're trying out solar farms they're trying out wind energy they're all this sort of stuff now i know a lot of people can say yeah but it's all like corporate banks and this stuff but it's not it's not as bad as you think it is there is a lot of there is a push for things to actually improve in within the establishment as it is and we shouldn't discard that or say that this is irrelevant because it's not and it's also it's even more relevant because it is actually something that's happening and it's happening in in real time and in real life so um i think yes that's um there are there are certainly things that can happen within the government structure within the current administrative structures that we have and uh, we can literally uh, map some of our ideas onto that structure and start creating the better thing because at the end of the day, in my opinion, we're not going to have this. We're not going to have this sudden overturn of society where we're going to we're going to go from this capitalist society to suddenly everything is overturned into an RBE or open access economy or money free world. Excuse me, whatever you like to call it. It just, I promise you, it's not going to happen like that. It's going to happen gradually. It's going to graduate from one from one system into another. There's not going to be any big explosive revolution where everything changes and all the government just gets put out on the streets. I promise you this won't happen. What's going to happen is it's going to graduate from this. The ideas that sort of that I promote and other people promote will slowly more and more become adopted into mainstream culture. And I have to tell you guys, I, I see this happening now. I, I've already seen this happening, stuff that... Um, Stuff that I talked about maybe eight or nine years ago, you know, like Money Free World and, you know, uh, being more compassionate and uh, being more caring about the environment, this kind of stuff. Stuff that was really kind of laughed about, like, not so long ago, like eight or nine years ago. It's now really been taken seriously, really been taken seriously. So um, things are changing. So hang in there. Don't think, oh, God, it's not changing. We, what's, what we miss is that the change is imperceptible it's it's slow and gradual but i promise you it's changing because if you do an a b comparison between government today and government 10 years ago you will see that the priorities of government today are, are much more in line from the kind of things that we talk about than they were 10 years ago okay so that's that's a given thing so that was uh, lloyd's question now of course I, I, because i have to change videos i don't see the the other comment but actually there was a guy i do remember there was a guy called blair or lady called Blair? I don't know. Um, anyway, a person called Blair. Well, you can't say man or woman anymore. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, so a person called Blair said that a lot of the RBE people are against religion. And that's an interesting question. Yeah, so let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Personally, I'm not against religion. I'm not against religion at all. Um, I describe myself as uh, well, I can't remember Dawkins um, scale of theos, theism I can't remember but I think I'm somewhere like number five or number six in that scale whereas I'm not a I'm not a strong atheist but I'm a um, cheerful agnostic I suppose I say I, I think that the existence of God is very improbable but of course you can't rule it out for certain anyway that's not even important the point is that um, yeah, a lot of people are anti-religious and a lot of people actually, I find, well, actually, that's another thing I'll talk about that we're talking about. We need to talk about science a little bit later. Um, but a lot of people here are anti-religious and that, and I think it's that's, it's it's bad news, you know, it really is bad news. We, we, that's, you know, we have to be inclusive. You know, you want to talk, talk about an RBE economy, which is what people are, are um, what people are, are basically promoting mostly is, um, this vision like of Jacques Fresco and that sort of stuff where, where everything is kind of more um, engineering focused and that sort of thing. And that there's no real room for religion in that. But I, I have to say, I disagree. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna dive into the science thing. Yeah, I knew I was gonna do that anyway. But I, I think it's kind of related actually, this whole religion versus science kind of dichotomy thing, which is kind of 
seems to be happening here and seems kind of a little bit um, irrational to me. Um, it can, it doesn't have to be science versus religion. I mean, it doesn't have to be that, you know. You can argue it can be evidence versus no evidence. Yeah, maybe that's 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 a useful thing to talk about. But um, I find actually a lot of the people that I talk about, or like that I talk with, is that the people who who are kind of, shall I say, dogmatic about science and science as an approach are more, to me, are more dogmatic than the people who are advocating religious approach. And I think that's, that's noteworthy in itself because um, at the end of the day, it's not really religion that's the problem. It's not whatever my personal belief in, in stuff, whatever out there, it doesn't really, it shouldn't affect anyone else, you know. And, but what it, when it does affect someone else is when I'm like blathering about it all the time and I'm trying to ram it down your neck and say, well, I believe this, you've got to believe this too. So that, that sort of stuff, is is dogmatism, and that I think comes a lot more. I find that more in the in this the, the science literacy type of type of group of people seem to be kind of pushing that sort of stuff almost in a religious way. And I know that they're they're going to hate me saying that, but I find that that's sort of it's the same dogmatic mechanism in the mind that's saying, well, look, my approach is correct, and I'm not tolerating any others. Okay, we, we, we really need to get past that, you know, we really need to get past that. For me, it's not as simple as science versus no science or religious versus no science versus no religion. It's not as simple as that. It's, it's, about, um, it's, a, it's, it's about compassion, it's about uh, growth, it's about the, the spirit of being human, whatever that means to you. And it's about learning how to get along. It's about learning how to... Um, Think better about um, group outcomes rather than individual outcomes because obviously we know we know now that now that there's seven and a half billion of us we know that individual outcomes look at individual outcomes all the time it just can't work it can't work long term you know so that's that's already over that idea is, is already over so we have to think about the things in these terms whether that means okay we adopt this, uh, we adopt a scientific um, approach to a certain problem, or whether we adopt maybe religious approach or spiritual approach to a certain problem. It's not that important to me, and what's important is that we actually, we end up with the, the, the result that kind of, that maintains that sort of, um, that cohesion of, of um, uh, how should I say, of these, the, our spirituality, I suppose, what it means to be human, what, what makes our lives enjoyable, what makes us laugh, what makes us love, what makes us cry, all this stuff is, is if at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about this journey of being human and, and being here for a limited time and having a great time. That's what we want, you know? Um, that, that's when we talk about money free worlds, I mean, it's not, we don't really talk about money free world. We just want, to have a really full and rich life with no one pissing us off. I mean, that's really what we want, you know, isn't it? So, at the end of the day, that's what that that thing about being uh, human and having um, having really full, enjoyable lives is what it is. And whether that means whether you come through that through God or through science, I think it's fine. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really, I don't care about either or. Obviously, there are certain things in like uh, when you want to build a certain technological device or something like that well you have to use science you have to use evidence you have to say well you have to use trial and error well this this one exploded but this one hasn't exploded so this one that didn't have not exploded is probably better unless we're building a bomb that is so the way you basically just keep you trial and error with that with that sort of stuff and um, that's what that's what helps build things yeah and that's all but it's not so it's not so simple to actually just map that idea of evidence versus no evidence onto life itself and onto the human condition, onto us being happy, have, having fulfilling relationships and uh, uh, having a fulfilling life. That's, that's, it's not really about evidence. That's, there is more of a spiritual aspect to that. And I, I, for me, we can't discard that spirituality aspect. Um, it's actually, it's, we, can, we, can, we can contain multiples, you know? We are not a, like fucking binary, computers where it must be one or zero and that's it no we can we can have science we can have religion we can have music art we can have um, all these kind of weird human shit all around us we can we can we live in that stuff and that's that's great let's let's keep it like that let's keep the diversity let's um 
let's just promote what makes uh, a good life for us. Um, so, okay, let, let's go to a couple of these comments. So that was Blair, excuse me. And Christine um, says, okay, so how can people be, can this Christine Thindy, who, uh, hi Christine, I met you in uh, Frankfurt last year, I think. It's lovely to meet you. And uh, how can people be convinced who believe this is communism or socialism, which in their opinion always fails me? Yeah. Hmm, well, it doesn't matter. It, 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 I, I wouldn't worry about that. If somebody is, if somebody is uh, talking about this is communism, this is socialism. It, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't get upset about that. You know, I, I I hear that sort of stuff all the time. And maybe I just, if I if I'm re writing someone on Facebook, I might just reply a comment saying, well, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I don't see. I don't see how that how it helps anything because. At the end of the day, the problem, guys, with this the money-free world idea, with resource-based economy, with open access economy, whatever you want to call it, gift economy, gift society, excuse me, I just had my dinner. With all that stuff, we could talk till the cows come home. We really can, and we can argue till the cows come home. We can talk about communism, socialism, we can talk about ethical capitalism, all that sort of stuff. But the only thing that matters is what works. That's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters. I mean, actions are louder than words or whatever, you know, add in whatever your favorite idiom in, the, in there is. But the point is that theories are great. It's nice to write theories. I've done it myself. It's good. Theories are great. They're good fun and it's a way of exploring new ideas and we need that. We do need to do that. And this is what like, the likes of uh, Karl Marx and all these uh, other guys have written about, uh, von Mises and uh, all these, uh, uh, sorry, the names escape me now. These, these basically guys who, who pontificate about different ways of structuring society. And we need that. Yes, we do need that. But at the end of the day, unless it's something that works, then it's 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 pointless, really. It's pointless. Now, my I've kind of come more more around to the opinion that we cannot we cannot map a, a particular idea of society onto society. We cannot say, you know, in mind, I've got an idea. Society should be like this, and we write a little formula like that. And then we say, right, now we're, going, now we're going to implement that, like we do in a computer program. Okay, I've got this algorithm. Okay, I'm going to open up my code page. I'm going to squirt in my algorithm, and do, 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 all the changes are going to happen, like the matrix. That's great. That works on computers. It doesn't fucking work with human beings, okay? It's really, I think it's really important that people get that idea, okay? Human beings are really messy, sloppy, dogmatic, um, irritating, uh, badly educated, uh, rough creatures. Okay, I'm, I'm saying all the bad things there. Obviously, we're great things as well. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying that when you have your little idea that you you wrote on it on a book and you put it out there in the world, they're just going to tear it to shreds because it's it's not going to it's not going to to take very well. And even even if you do have some success with it, you will probably have a, a hugely disgruntled minority who are going to basically upset the whole apple cart. Okay, no, we we did not ask for this. We do not want this, and we will fight this with every every bone in our body. So you're going to have you're going to have that sort of that disgruntled minority, and uh, that's that's always going to be a problem. And that's why we have revolutions because people say, well, that, that they're not happy with the status quo. Now, when you take a, a an algorithm or formula for society and try and put it in society, you're going to have the same problem. You're going, to, you're always if 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 you do really well and it does well, great. But you're always going to have this disgruntled minority say, "Well, I don't fucking like that formula, and I'm going to fight this with every bone in my body." Okay, so my my thinking has really come a long way, really, since the days when I did the free work charter. I kind of had this idea. Okay, well, here's a here's like a statute of principles. 10 principles and we need to operate by these things and that sort of stuff and maybe the idea is that you know the government would adopt these principles and then do, do, do all of society would, would change like that well I, I, I gotta be honest i don't really think that's going to happen no, i don't think that's going to happen i think the free world charter is like a it's like an aspirational um interesting idea and uh, and it's a kind of a, a theoretical 
idea. Um, but I don't think that someone's that's the government are going to say, okay, we're adopting the free word charter. I don't think I don't see that happening. We also had the we had the UN Charter on Human Rights, which I think was written in the nineteen fifties or nineteen forties, I don't remember. Um, this is this is like a worthless document. You know, it was like a, a again, it's like an aspirational thing, but most of that stuff is just ignored. Um, so typically our society creates itself we have a, like a, a self-organizing society a human human society is a self-organizing system it always was always has been we sort of, we adapt as little changes little new things come along new technology comes along and uh, we we change the way we do things and that filters out to society and, to, and society changes like that so we certainly better chance of um of of, of Ad adapting to a money-free world if we wait for technology just to keep coming which it is coming in, in leaps and leaps and bounds we, if we if we sat back and wait I mean we're this the, the like the RBE vision the kind of the the, the um, sort of uh, the more um, what did you say technological or what's the word technocracy or technological society that kind of thing um, will that will play out I mean that's that's a certainty there's no doubt about that it's the sort of stuff that the Venus project proposes these really the, these um, fascinating sort of ideas that they put out there I mean that's that's an absolute certainty there's no there's no there's no I mean unless we blow ourselves to pieces first I mean we are going that direction we are going to do a super automated to a very highly organized highly efficient society that's definitely going to happen but for me the the, the problem is that maybe that's not going to happen fast enough so maybe time is is the problem here and uh this is why i i sort of um i, I kind of split from the idea of rbe i could i didn't want to promote this anymore i wanted to go more towards um something that was more simpler and something that was behavioral based and something that we could actually uh work on uh, today and that's why I started uh, moving towards the open access economy and we, we created the sort of the wiki page about that. Well, you check out the openaccesseconomy.org if you want to find out more about that. But what it, what it basically is, is instead of saying, okay, let's just wait for technology to completely overwhelm the uh, current capitalist system, um, I'm saying that there are things that we can do on a micro level, on a micro, microscopic level as individuals that can start shaping society that way. And maybe in some ways that could help um, prepare society for RBE later on or something like that, perhaps. But the point is that there are lots of little things that we can do today that will actually create small and bigger and bigger ripples as we go along. And these things are, are really common sense things that even governments today are kind of starting to lean towards, okay? Um, so things like um, obviously becoming more eco-aware, becoming, trying to go, go more environment friendly, you know, don't use the plastic bags, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, this, this, this is all plus stuff, you know, the more we do that, the more we encourage others to do it and that sort of stuff, that's, that's, that's good. But then there's other things that, um, that we can do that, that are, that are basically are peeling us away slowly from the capitalist system and that's basically to start sharing things more to start offering our certain goods and services with to each other uh, on on sites like free world or, or helpful peeps or um and uh, uh, um, simbi or the, these ones where people are basically exchanging or just giving gifting goods and services freely this is something that i think is really important because nothing changes society more than at a, than at an economic level nothing changes human relationships more than the economic level i mean this this is to me is is fact absolute fact we know that basically i mean think about it people tend to sort of like you more when you help them more or when you give them more things or if you've got loads of money or if you if you've got a fancy car or something like that i don't know this we, we we are kind of hardwired to sort of to gravitate towards the things which are good for us economically okay so if we have a if we have a we, we want to have a really good job we want to get we want to get rich we want to have a big house we, i mean generally speaking here okay we want to we want to have things which which um, give us 
uh, economic uh, power, I suppose. We want to have those things. And one of the, uh, the things about sharing is, is that it gives us an alternative way of actually having, of gaining that economic power and, and advantage in our relationships. It creates relationships from that economic level. I don't know if I'm explaining this well. The, 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 the point is that society is glued together by personal, by microeconomies, by how we access the, the resources and the things that we need, by how we give the, the resources and things that we have to other people, whether it's through money or whether we gift it, that's not the point. The point is that that's, that's the, the, the web of society is those little economic interactions with each other. And this, this is a very simple way to prove this, and that is that like the, the huge percentage of the world's population live in cities. And the only reason people live in cities is for economic reasons, okay? So it's very easy to create, to, to be wealthy, it's more easy to have wealth, personal wealth in a city than it is when you're living in the, the, the back fields, and back rice fields or something. So point is that, when we start altering that, that economic web, that, that, that sort of interaction with each other on that fundamental level, that changes our society. That's, 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 those little, those little um, economic transactions um, start changing society where we suddenly realize slowly that, well, hang on, maybe we don't, we don't need to actually earn this and then buy this. Maybe we just have to, if we, if we, engage in a particular type of behavior well look i can just i can just have this without necessarily having to supply something directly in exchange and it's this very idea of exchange that is kind of at the heart of the, all the problem you know the heart that we we feel that we must trade like for like in the open access economy thing i call it explicit trade explicit trade is where i give something to you and you give something exactly of the same value to me whether it's money or whether it's an item it's, it's not important the, but what's important is that we have to, we have, we um, we believe that that's the only way it can work. And if, if you don't have something to give me, then either the exchange doesn't take place, or you go and borrow of someone else who gives you something, and then you give your thing to me. So that so I mean that's it's very very bloody limiting. You know, it's like a, you know you, that you can't access the things that you you need and you want because of this, this limiting mindset, which is really something that we invented, you know, and there's, uh, it's something that can be, that we can reinvent. Um, in the open access economy, we talk about implicit trade, which is basically the idea of that once you, once you have joined a, such a community where this is kind of the normal behavior, uh, that people give and share things freely, once you once you are uh, part of that community, you find that that the um, you don't actually have to give back exactly what you what you're receiving, but rather that you you have a, an understanding. There's an understanding exists that basically we all kind of give things, and when we all give things, it creates a circular effect, and uh, everyone gets what they need. That's the theory, anyway. I'm not going to tell you now that it 100 it's going to work because I don't know because uh, it's, it's not, hasn't been proven at scale. You know, we haven't, this idea hasn't been tried at scale. It's been tried a lot on smaller scale and I can tell you it doesn't work, okay? But it needs to happen at scale for it to, to work. And the reason for that is, is that, well, in the same reason as, as our capitalist economy, the reason that works is because we have huge diversity in it. So there's so many things available to us, so many different types of things available to us, um, so many different opportunities and ways of doing it that that just creates that just makes it work because there's just so many options you know you can go and uh, you know you want to buy uh, potatoes or something like that you have money to buy potatoes you've got 10 shops close to you that all sell potatoes you have all these these myriad of options you know and so that's that's what makes that work but in if if you applied the same thing, if you had if, if, theoretically, if you had the same thing with a, like a, a gift society, like what um, Mark Enoch talks about, if you have like a gift society, then you imagine you had ten neighbors lived close to you who all had potatoes that they were happy to provide for you. This is you have options. Then maybe you also have somebody else who's providing vegetables or some other thing that you need 
down the road. So when you have that, when you have that range and diversity in the system like that, it suddenly becomes possible because it's not like I'm giving something to you and then I'm waiting for you to give something back to me because I'm waiting to pay this guy over here because he's waiting to pay that guy over there. It's, it's we kind of, we, we do away with all that, but we need, obviously it relies on education and people uh, having different expectations of life um, than we do now today. So you have to say that, um, that is, it's part of part of that making that work is that we have to work together as a community. You know, that's that's just the thing. We have to sort of deal with each other on a in a in a more uh, in a more real way, in a more real way than we do today. If today, like say, like we have these ten potato shops as I mentioned, you basically you don't have to talk to any of these guys. You just go in with your your money, you, you buy your potatoes, and you go home. You can grunt if you want, and uh, no one. There's no relationship happening there. That would, that would be slight, probably slightly different in a, in a sort of an open access economy where it's kind of you have, their, you have to go to your neighbor who's, who's going to provide these things to you. And there's more of a sort of, a, there's more of an airing of gifting about us, you know, and he's happy to give them to you because he's happy that somebody else is going to gift something else to him and, and likewise. So, like I say, I don't know if it's going to work. I, 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 I honestly don't know, but I, I can tell you that I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to get to that position where basically we all can um, access the things we need unconditionally and um, with, well, unconditionally and without like trashing the place. So we have to, I think it's where we have to go. I don't, I don't think there's an option about it. I think maybe in 30, 40 years time, I think the sort of stuff that I'm talking about and that a lot of guys are talking about now Will will be normal. It'll, it will be the new normal that we have to move towards. I mean, we always already see like a, in America a huge rise of co-op businesses, and that's kind of a, that's going along the same route. It's kind of saying right instead of having one big boss and a load of workers, okay, no, we are all the boss, and we all we all take share in the profits. I mean that's that's um, that's not an open access economy, but it's 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 along the road. It's a much it's a much vast improvement on what we have now today. Where you have your boss who is driving your his Lamborghini, and uh, a bunch of uh, blue collar workers uh, for, you know, making uh, pushing peanuts around or whatever. So the point is that I think that um, this the the sharing aspect of economy and collaboration, cooperation, all this must become a feature of human society. It just must. We don't have a choice with that. There's just too many people around on the planet today. To be to be using a competition where that that creates waste, that creates uh, unnecessary duplicity of of pointless products that uh, basically um, is, is is really geared for just for chomping resources. We can't keep doing that. We just can't keep doing that. And when you say, well, well, what is the option if we stop doing that? Even if we continue capitalism, if we stop with all this waste. What are we going to end up with? You know, we're going to have this kind of very sad, lonely capitalism where we're you're kind of you just everyone gets like one hundred dollars a month, and you can only just buy this sort of stuff. This is kind of like it's it's like like what the UBI is almost proposing. This kind of for me a horrible idea of giving everyone an unconditional income. Well, well, that's another matter. <laughs> we're not going to there. But anyway, that's, that's, I don't like the UBI idea because I think that it's basically it's not really solving anything at all. It's basically putting a large patch, large and leaky patch on the problem. It's not solving anything about environmental waste and, and poor poor human relationships, etc. Anyway, the, the the point is that that um, you can, with the this is capitalism if we keep going this way we can we can either keep going the way until we get this you know this one winner and the whole place completely fucking destroyed we can keep going that way or we can go a kind of a more ethical capitalism where we like we reduce our consumption we reduce everything and um you know and, and kind of life becomes kind of quite dull and communistic or something like that i don't think that either of those is a is a, is a good option for us as a species, I think we can we can we can do away with all that by putting away this idea of trade altogether, this idea of explicit trade, and move towards uh, the implicit trade and the sharing mod model, where basically 
we're we are working together because we enjoy doing it, because it's good fun, because it's it's uh, there's camaraderie and it's great for community and that sort of stuff. Um, it's um, it's not it's not completely technologically based. Um, I don't think that's a good I don't think that's a good solution either, because I think if we are all just like lying around on our on our hover beds with robots doing everything for us, I think that's a very that's going to be a very sad way for people to live because I think that we are as 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 animals we're hardwired to toil somewhat and uh, we need to be we need to feel productive we need to feel like that our lives are useful and I think the, the one of the ways of doing that is in actually um, is engaging in things like community service or working with other people or doing things for other people unconditionally I think that's really that's the essence of, of being human is is helping each other is being there for each other is feeling useful and how many people in the world today do not feel useful how many people are like are like suffering with depression or other sort of uh, diseases which are not fucking diseases at all they're basically absolute direct byproducts of a of a flawed system how many people are actually suffering because they feel useless because they feel powerless because they don't have any the control over anything and they're just lashing out at at, at, at the world um, and it's because they don't feel like they are useful and i think that that's very sad and i think that it, this is also epidemic an absolute epidemic an unspoken epidemic um, i don't have any numbers on it now but I can tell you from my own personal experience, I deal with a lot of people, I speak to a lot of people who have mental issues of one kind or another. I mean, I see it all the time, all the time. Way too much for comfort, way too much. And if I'm seeing it that much, I'm sure other people are seeing it as, as much or even more. So that's a big thing. And I think that that, come, that stems from the idea of not having this higher purpose where you're valued by your family or by your community or um, that you're not producing anything of value. I mean, I, I, can tell, I can tell you that as someone who's worked pretty much all my life, I suppose, um, that when you, even if you're doing a, like a shitty job, if you're flipping burgers or something like that, I think it still gives you a sense of fulfillment at the end of the day. Uh, it still gives you a kind of thing, well, I did something, I contributed something today. That That is hardwired into us. I, I, I'm, I'm certain of it. That this this feeling of, yeah, I, did, I contributed something useful today and uh, maybe I got paid like $2 an hour or something stupid. But I think that the money is one thing, but the other thing is the feeling productive, feeling useful. That's really, a, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. And I think that if we, if we, push for a completely 100% technological society, I think that's that's not going to end well because if you're, you're taking people away from uh, the ability to uh, produce usefully, and I'm not talking about sitting around writing fucking poetry and, and painting pictures here, which is what people are talking about. No, I'm talking about being productive in a useful way, like going out and helping somebody with... Uh, weeding their garden for four hours or something like that you know maybe i mean maybe people who like propose a technological society wouldn't would much prefer a robot to do that but i would disagree i would say that going out there and getting your hands dirty and getting working hard like that is a really great feeling you really feel great afterwards feel really pumped up endorphins flowing i think it's there's no there's no feeling like it you know when you're engaged in good labor and you're not necessarily doing it for for cash but you're doing it for a favor or something like that i've seen that so many times in my life where people had agreed to help me or something or i agreed to, to help those people and this it's just you just get a huge buzz out of being helpful even if it was something you didn't really like doing you weren't that fussed about doing it but you, you helped out anyway that gives us that that i don't know that sort of connection that's just that little connection with the world and with our community and that's what's really important you know i think anyway i feel like i'm rabbiting on too much uh, i don't think there's any other comments here oh my god there are okay neil jones 
Um, Neil Jones, yes, uh, I know two Neil Jones, I don't know which one it is, but um, Neil Jones, you have a deeply conditioned society living in an authoritarian middleman system. How do we end this top-down cycle? Authorita excuse me, authoritarian middleman system. And, do, 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 do. Yeah. Well, I mean, deeply conditioned, yeah. I mean, you can say we're deeply conditioned or you can say we're just poorly educated. I prefer to say we're poorly educated. Um, if we, you know, if we are really well educated, if we're educated properly, then people can send us any all kind of propaganda bullshit. We're, we're not going to swallow it, you know. Um, I know for myself, I mean, there's... Um, I'm somebody, I, I suppose, who is self-educated. I mean, I, I educated myself not just in whatever academic things, but in the ways of the world, I suppose. And I'm, of, well, I'm 50 years old now, so I have a, seen a few things and I've kind of copped on a lot more than I was 30 years ago. And uh, I can tell you now that one thing that I can't stand, and I think most people is I can't stand watching television. It's actually impossible for me to sit and watch television now because it's like, Oh my God! This fucking bullshit! They're they're ramming down my neck here. You know I can't listen to it. You know? I, I sometimes I go to my parents' house and they have like Sky News turned up at eleven on the dial. You know, and they're talking about the fucking the royal baby or this sort of stuff. And I'm there. Ah, get me fucking out of here. You know. And so I I think I think um it's not it's not really conditioning. Conditioning really is just a matter of poor education and poor poor self responsibility that's that's what i think what, we're, what we what we need most of all you know i think a lot of people um are aren't responsible they don't feel responsible for the problems in the world or for the things that are, are, are that are that are out of their control and uh, i see that a lot maybe in people who are promoting money free ideas that um they we kind of were going out there to blame people all the time but I think at the end of the day, there is there is no there's no villain. There really there really isn't a villain. The the villain is, as I said on Quora there recently, the villain is us. We are the ones who are perpetuating the system. We are the ones who are well, not maybe not you personally, maybe not me personally, but I'm, I'm talking in general. The average consumer is the person who is perpetuating the system, which keeps the top guy at the top and the bottom guy at the bottom. They are the person, and these are the people. The I would call them, I like to call them the hard-pressed middle class. I think this is a really, this is where the nub of the problem is and where the nub of the solution is, is in the hard-pressed middle classes. I'll just I'll run with, with, with me on this. Uh, somebody has asked me there before about where, where, does, where is change going to come from? And what do you think about it? I mean, it's mixed, it's, it's quite simple. The, the guys, the guys at the top of the pyramid, the rich guys, but of course they're not going to want to change anything. What's, what's the incentive? Why would they bother with having a great time? And that's fine, that's fine. And maybe if we were living at that apex of the pyramid, we would do the same. The guys at the bottom are also not going to make this happen. Why? Because they're disempowered, because maybe they're on drugs, because maybe they're living just a very poor environment. Maybe they're just working so damn hard just to, to stop being put out in the street. Um, these people, they don't have time for revolution. They don't have time for, for listening, sitting down and listening to new ideas. The answer to this, guys, is in us, the hard-pressed middle class. I put myself in this bracket. I'm a guy, I'm not poor, I'm, I'm certainly not rich, but and I struggle sometimes to, to keep the bills going. And I'm, I'm sure most people watching this probably are in that same position, you know? And we are the guys who, who affect change because we're the ones who we're kind of comfortable. Uh, we have a bit of time. We're not. We're really. We're not. We're not hungry. We're not. Um, we're not on the street. We're. We have a little bit of money. We're not much, but we have a little bit. And I think that we are the ones who can bring the change. We can. We can the ones who can start demonstrating a different type of society that will eventually filter up to the top guy, filter down to the bottom guys. I think it's it's up to us. It's up to us, the hard pressed middle class, who basically who can implement a different type of economy through it, uh, relationships, as I was saying earlier, to the open access economy, which is basically about just changing micro microscopic changes in behaviour, just to alter the the fabric of of our culture. And I think that with with us guys, because we have more time because we have a little bit of money because we're 
we're um, educated because we're we're more educated than than poor people are because we have that we have the we have what I think is the magic formula to actually make change. Okay, so that's why I promote um, open access economy, which promotes um, sharing. Uh, uh, Promotes uh, more more education, better education. Um, I don't know. I'd, I think that if un until we until we realise that actually the sort of money free society that we want to see, the resource based economy that we want to see, until we realise that that is actually it's really just a manifestation of people sharing. It really is. It really is. And actually, have, it was. Rafi, a friend of mine, Rafi, who kind of opened my eyes to that, you know, because I was kind of talking RBE, RBE years ago, and he just said to me something like, well, it's an RBE is just basically sharing, isn't it? You know, I have to say, I mean, naive as I was, it blew my mind, and I, it, it's right, it's right, it's not, we, I, don't, I just don't think this going through a fully technological society is, is a good idea, I just don't think so, I think it's going to happen, I think it's going to happen anyway, I mean, we're all, technology isn't going away, and things are going to uh, improve technologically, that's for sure. And it's going to make things easier. It's already made things easier. And uh, but I just think that the end goal is not to have a resource-based economy. It's not to have a money-free economy. It's not to have an open access economy. These are not end goals. These are basically the, the means to to the end goal. And what's the end goal? The end goal is basically creating happy humans. Happy, responsible humans. That's this. I mean, people who have rich, fulfilling lives, who are not fucking wrecking the place, who are not shooting each other, who are not like just uh, trying to fool each other all the time, who are basically, I don't know, uh, responsible custodians of the planet, who aren't slaughtering billions of animals every year, who aren't basically trying to just continuously reproduce, reproduce because somebody said overpopulation is a myth. This is ridiculous behavior. No, let's, let's, let's live here responsibly. Let's live here happily. Let's have a fantastic life. Let's enjoy each other and um, let's do it well. And let's do it. And if that means we go money free or RBE, then let's do it. Let's do it. And let's, let's tap into those feelings that basically create us, that make us feel alive and well and make us feel happy where we're, where we're being productive members of our of our smaller communities, where this makes this is at the end of the day is where is where happiness springs from is our, our means of our, our own self uh, our self uh, means of production how we actually uh, provide ourselves and give ourselves to the world. That's this is why we we enjoy our jobs because we feel satisfied and and, and fulfilled from doing that. Okay, let's see if there are any other comments. I don't know if there is. Um, excuse me. Oh, okay. Um, ah, okay, Nick Tapping uh, asked, do you think we should ask the UN for support in promoting their Article 25? Do you think the UN Declaration of Human Rights Article 25 would be a good start to the transition? Hmm. Do, they, do, do I think the UN is inherently socialist? Um, I, n Article 25, I don't, I'm not actually sure what that is, Nick. Uh, Article 25 is the Declaration of Human Rights or something? I'm not, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know what that is, I have to say. I've heard it before, but I don't know what it is. Do I think the UN is inherently socialist? I don't know. No? Why? I mean, I don't know. I don't see the point of that question. For example, I, I, the UN is, it's obviously, uh, I think it's a good organization, yeah? I think it's, it's, like, it's like Facebook. It's more good than it's bad. Okay. Um, Adam Maloney... Oh yeah, no, he's just replying to Blair. Okay. Uh, okay, a guy called Josh Halton, who I also know very well. Hi, Josh. Uh, free order needs to be pitched to charities, nonprofits, and potential volunteers. Honor Pay promoted as a bank. Yeah. Okay. I am um, as uh, Honor Pay is another uh, project that I did a couple of years ago. It's basically um, it's a it's an open awards network where basically you can it's kind of, it's not really it's kind of like a currency, but not really. It's like uh, where you basically can honor somebody by just sending them an honor on this thing and it's, it's really just a symbolic token of gratitude doesn't have any value or anything like that and the reason i um put that together was because i felt that um the 
that part of the money system that is good is there, there's a sense of reward that you get from when someone pays you for a job. I think this is a, a palpable thing. I think that it's, uh, it's useful that if, when we do a good job, we get rewarded for that. I think that's good. Honor, an honor pay or an honor is something that I thought could maybe someday substitute that, that reward mechanism, excuse me, where you do a good job, somebody sends you an honor and it's like a, it's like a, a public, um, public acknowledgement of what you did for them. And uh, then you, you sort of, you build up a kind of an honor score, which is kind of like a, like a, I don't know, like your, your social history or something like that. So it's a, that was, that's the idea that, that honor pay, it's built into the free world of things. So if somebody, if, if you're dealing with somebody on free world or now who's giving you a good, um, a free uh, item or service and you can, you can send them back an honor. So that's, so that's kind of built in there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The free world, I agree, Josh, the free world needs to be pitched to charity, non-profit and potential volunteers. Yeah. We're actually, um, Free Worlder is going to be going. I'm sorry, it's going to be undergoing a, a major change in the next twelve months. I say we have big plans for that, and um, you have to stay tuned for that because we're still working out the details. But basically, it will be rebranded. It's going to be called something else. It's going to be going into an app. It's going to be going very much mainstream culture. One of the problems that I have found with Free Worlder is that it's aimed too much as activist community and while that's great i think the activist community is too small to make a viable prototype economy with the free world and so so uh, basically what we'll be doing is um taking 90 percent of the ideas and just really repackaging it into something much more mainstream i have to say i'm really really excited about it really really excited about it i think it's going to be fucking huge sorry excuse me that's just my opinion Anyway, I'm entitled to my opinion. Anyway, um, okay, um, Nick, uh, Nick Tapping again says, a lot of people do not understand the UN. Oh, it's not a cohesive organization. Da, 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 da. Okay, I think he's just replying to Blair there. Okay, so good, so there's a bit of um, an exchange going on there between Blair and Nick. Um, Liberate Mankind, AKA Eric Schmidt. Sorry to blow your cover there, man. What about genuinely scarce items? Original works of art, antique furniture, truffles, that sort of thing. How do these get allocated? Yep. Well, how are they? How are they allocated now? How? I mean, look at look at the the Mona Lisa. There's only one of its kind in the world. How is it allocated now? Who gets to have that? By and large, actually, it's not even it's not even cash that gets it because I'm sure there'd be plenty of people out there who would love to buy the Mona Lisa for some ridiculous telephone number amount of money, but it's not for sale. And it's, um, nor should it be, of course. So you would have to say it's not just money that basically that decides which, where, um, where scarce, scarce items are, are, are allocated. Um, it does, um, I mean, there's loads of uh, examples of that of fine arts or um, sculptures and that sort of stuff, which are basically, they're, um, what's the word? They're taken care of by governments, um, that they're they're sort of I can't, I can't think of the word now. Sorry, but basically they are looked after by certain institutions. Okay, whether they're like um, academic institutions or government institutions, uh, that sort of stuff, or libraries and that sort of stuff. In Ireland, I know they have the Book of Kells, which is like a fantastic artifact of uh, written in the ninth or tenth century by monks of beautiful coloured drawings. It's really a masterpiece. And uh, this is a, it's in the Trinity Library in, in Dublin, and um, I think maybe that's that the, the maybe these library and academic institutions. I mean, the, there's nothing wrong with these guys. These are fantastic institutions. We should have more of these things. And obviously, if um, like, like scarce items like uh, like fine arts, are, they're they deserve to have a place that fitting for where they belong. And if, if people are, are sufficiently educated, which they need to be for this kind of society to work, because unless we're properly educated, the society's not going to work anyway, and we're not going to be worrying about Mona Lisa. It's going to be like, uh, just, you know, burning it with, it with some tires somewhere. It's unless, unless we're properly educated, it's not going to work anyway. So that's, that's a given. So, and when we are properly educated in how the world works and how the, how the best, how to get the best outcomes for community, for, people in general, 
Um, we're not going to be fighting over who's going to among them, who's going to want to hang the Mona Lisa in their bathroom. You know, I think we're going to be we're going to be more receptive and respectful of of um, those kind of precious items. And in some ways, maybe they'll become even more precious when when they sort of become sort of community owned, I suppose. Anyway, there's probably lots of precedent for that for like uh, community owned things which are which are respected. I mean, it was, I can't think of anything offhand, but generally when something is owned by a community, like for example, if you live in a sort of a, in a small community where they have like uh, public amenities, like a nice public bench or a public fountain, generally people don't, they don't wreck these things because they know it's for everyone. They don't, every, it belongs to everyone. So why would they, they wreck it, you know? And the only people who would wreck something like that are people who are just not educated, who are just clueless or whatever, don't understand why why it's there, why it's important. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, um, Blair is responding here. I think there's actually the thread of conversation there, which I'm not following here. Um, Daniel Martin says, I wondered if the way to move to a free society is to create a fund that members to donate that the members donate to and profits can be paid into. This fund will buy up as much as it can, maybe slating businesses, starting businesses and finding a way to give the products out for free, then buying houses and giving them to members free with a legal stipulation that you can not sell it, just donate it free to me. Yeah, I get the idea. Yep, yeah, that's that's a great idea. I I'm raw for these kind of for this transitional capitalism ideas. I think I think in some ways it's we have to do that you know we have to engage with the system that we have we can't just like like i was saying earlier we can't just flip over the the world and go, we're just gonna it's not, it's not going to change like that in a in a flick of a finger it's gonna the change is going to be gradual and part of that gradual change is like we see with the the rise of co-op businesses where and the worker-owned companies these things are, are, are going massive now in the states I know I've been reading stats on that it's really exciting and uh, yeah and um, oh yeah do you also see the like benefit corps that's another thing that's happening where a large um, corporation I think like Danone and uh, this is one of their becoming a, a benefit corp which basically means that they're putting in their Articles memorandum that basically they they have a certain responsibility towards the environment and towards looking after the workers. It's it's kind of like a higher level of thing, and it's something that you have to. It's like um, it's a certain standard that you have to actually um, apply for. So you, not everyone just gets it. You have to you have to operate the company in a certain way. That's exciting stuff as well. I know it's not perfect, and we got to we got to get it into our heads, guys. That. You can't, you can't stop expecting 100% perfection all the time. We got to say, okay, 40% is good, 50% good, 60% good. That's the way we have to, we have to go. We have to think in increments. You know, something is, maybe something sucks, but it's still more good than it's bad. You know, benefit corpse, like I mean, a lot of people will probably say terrible things about Danone, but they, they're basically, they're at least they're trying. They're starting to make efforts in, in that way. And maybe there are other, there are other. A corporation, but I know there are other corporations who are doing similar things where they're trying to move towards the benefit thing. Because at the end of the day, there is there is a change in mainstream culture where people are understanding now that we are we do have to change our priorities. The way we're doing it isn't working. It's not working. With the, I mean, you need to be stupid to see that, or you know, you just need to be ridiculous, ridiculously stupid to see that it's working because it isn't. Because everyone sees the the waste and the, the the toxicity of our current system. So even the guys at the top who own these corporations are also seeing that, and they're starting to make make changes like that. And I don't want to hear this kind of stuff as ah, it's all just PR. It's, all, it, it's not. It's not just PR. Okay, it's not just PR. Okay, I'm I'm pissed off hearing the people saying, well, look, all these CEOs are evil. These governments are 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 satanic or they're bad people we have to stop with that okay that's that's like um it's a nihilistic attitude it's not getting us anywhere we have to say well it's not perfect but okay that's better than it was last year okay it's not it's getting there it's going in the right direction we have to be more realistic about that you know that things are improving you know they are improving there's no doubt about that and i see a lot of them with companies and um, we actually um 
we're creating a company, Free World One, actually, that we actually um, that is doing something similar along the lines of what you said there, Daniel. That um, we it's a for-profit company, and we we actually got investments, quite a lot of investment last year towards building the the projects that we're doing, and um, the Life Games educational projects, Life Games books. Dot com. If you want to check that out, this is a this is something that's been funded by our investors, and it's a it's a commercial product that we're putting out there uh, into primary schools in UK and Ireland and and, and the English speaking world in general, and we're we're basically we're going to be selling this product for a profit, and the profits are going back into the company, which is going to help with other projects like the Free World project. It's going to help paying salaries. Of, People like me and people, other people who are working with the company, and so that so means that we can work on this full time. Um, this is really important because volunteering in this society now is really damn hard because you got to, you've only got a certain amount of hours in the day and you still have bills to pay. So when you're volunteering here, you're kind of impoverish, impoverishing yourself. Um, in the free world, one thing we've, we're doing something similar. We're putting into the the um, Articles memorandum that basically we have a maximum salary that the the CEO who will be me I suppose eventually that the, the CEO and the guys who are working in and they think they all get a maximum salary which is going to, going to be like the EU average it's like two or three thousand euros a month that no one in that company can earn more than that no matter what so if you have a company like that that becomes really really profitable. We can put, we can give some of that money back to shareholders, and also we can put all that money back into uh, into other projects. You know, so this is yeah, this this kind of commercial um, commercialization of transition. I think is, I think it's important. I think it's a reality. I think we have to deal with it. It might not be the most perfect thing, but I think it's something that we have to deal with because at the end of the day, we're we're standing on a on a you know on a gap between one foot in the old world and the other foot in the new world and we have to we have to deal with both worlds okay i'm traveling on here now okay so there's nothing really much here it's just a bit of an exchange between uh, blair and a, few, and a couple of other people um religion yeah there seems to be a, a bit of a conversation going Going on there about religion, I have to say, yeah, I, as I said earlier, I don't want to go on about it again. But I thought I don't think religion is uh, it's an important issue. I mean, religion or non-religion, for me, it's not, it's not an issue. I mean, I I know lots of people, um, activists, really well who work really well, and some of them are very like they're you know, born again Christians or Muslims or or atheists or whatever. That's I think it's fine. You know, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's in, um, as long as uh, they're 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 committed to following the same vision, that's all that's important, you know. And uh, at the end of the day, it's not religion; it's the problem. It's dogmatism is a problem, you know. It's that's, that's people's inflicting of views of their views on other people, which is kind of like a form of uh, mental violence or social violence, I suppose. I mean, we don't we don't need that. I mean, I'm more than happy to to um, listen to anyone's views on anything but um, I don't, I don't, I'm not uh, I don't like I don't want somebody to be forcing it on me as if that's the, the single only truth because well it isn't life is not that simple uh, I've come very much uh, um, away from this whole binary thing you know that's it really seems to pervade human society so much that it's got to be Democrat or Republic it's got to be red or blue it's got to be left or right it's got to be black or white it's got to be you know fucking i don't know communist or capitalist if it, i think actually an interesting uh, thing just before i go one of the things that i think about that is that i think our stories of our culture um our stories are basically they're almost always a good guy versus a bad guy okay all almost all our stories that pervade our culture, right? So, uh, hear me out here. So you have like, even in like the ancient times, you have the, the old um, fables and that sort of stuff. They always have like um, a, whatever, a, a hero and an anti-hero. And then of course, later times you have like the cops and robbers movies, you have cowboys and Indians, you have, um, oh gosh, um, yeah, you have all this stuff like the black versus white communities and that sort of stuff. And all this stuff is feeding into this idea that there is, there's one good, 
and there's one bad, and that these two guys cannot coexist. This, my friends, is fucking completely false. It is, it is not like that. Life is not like that. I've never seen or known life to be like that. It's fucking bullshit. And this is so strong in our culture that this is where we get this idea of, oh, the, we, we hate the rock, the Rothschilds or the, the oh, fuck it, the Richard Branson's of this world. These are the evil guys, the bad guys, or the Mark Zuckerbergs, all this sort of stuff. It's, it's just a projection of all this bullshit stories and TV and media that we consumed as kids where we have the, the Punch and Judy show, the good guy, and we have the bad guy. And of course, the, and, and on top of that, then the PR companies and the people who do that, they cash in completely on this. They know people are so easily swayed by this red versus blue, black versus white argument that they, they feed in on that. You know? And now we have like men versus women. You know, that we have sexual fucking wars going on. You know, they're going to be like, that, that, that. Oh, it's just, it's so fucking stupid that we have to have this constantly live in this kind of binary system where it's got to be A or B. And you must choose. You can't be A and B. You must be A or B. Which are you? This is, this is what we have to transcend, this sort of stuff. Of course it's A and B. Of course it's black and white. Of course it's cowboys and Indians. You know, it never was any different. You know, we have to break out of that that binary culture, I think that's that's really dangerous. It's not just capitalism versus communism. It's not RBE versus open access economy. It's not fucking uh, uh, Steph Molyneux versus Jacques Fresco. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, it's all of these things. It's the best of all these things all mixed together. And basically, unless it's, Everything is like a big mixing pot of ideas, and there's just so many great ideas out there now. And it doesn't matter where the idea comes from. If Mark Zuckerberg comes up with a great idea, then I'm all for it, you know? If uh, Steph Molyneux comes up with a good idea, which is rare, then that's, I'm all for that as well. So I just think that we have, to, we have to transcend the binary thing. Okay, look, I think I'm going on too much here. Um, uh, I hope I've answered uh, enough of their comments and questions there. Um, I've had a good time. Um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed some of it and take some things away from that. Um, the video will be available on the Money Free Parties site after, so please keep going with the comments, add more comments after, and I'll jump on and I'll, I'll answer them as much as I can. Um, so really enjoy doing this, and I, I think maybe I'm going to do some more of these because it's, it's, it's quite good fun, and uh, I have to say I can, I can talk about this kind of stuff until the cows come home. It's something I'm very passionate about. And um, I, I think I have some things to, some ideas to put in there. So I'm, 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 I'm happy about that. Okay, thanks a million for watching, guys. Thanks. Goodbye from Spain. Adios.